All right. Well, I have the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We have a special session this afternoon uh, with, of course, a great guest, and I'm really looking forward to how it's going to play out. Now, today's session is going to be presented, facilitated, conspired about by my good friend Ruben Puentadura. Now, if you don't know Ruben, you should. He's famous for quite a few things, being a fantastic presenter, a great developer, an incredibly funny person. He's also best known, I think, for creating the SAMR network, uh, which is a great way of rethinking educational technology. He's also well known for the education quintet, which I, again, recommend paying a lot of attention to. And what Ruben and I are going to be doing is we're going to be running a special kind of role-playing exercise. Uh, we've kept the details of this secret from everybody. Nobody knows uh, until a couple of seconds from now. Um, the idea is we're going to try to simulate a black swan event. But first, let me just bring Ruben up on stage and so he can just say who he is, where he's from, and you can then wonder if it is necessary to have a beard to be on the future transform. Now, let me see if he can see us here. Ruben, did I get the 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 one of you that is not logged in here. Let me get that. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. We've got Ruben here twice. There, 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 we, go. there we go. <laughs> Hello, oh. sir, and welcome. All right. Well, thank you for the kind introduction, Brian. Oh, it's really good to see you. Ruben, I, I, I can't remember the last so. time I've asked you this question, but what are you going to be working on for the next year? Well, right now I'm working very heavily on new uses of generative AI and large language models. I just got back from Costa Rica working on Terricense and Norteamericano on using the tool for language learning, but this is part of a much broader project that incorporates, yes, of course, large language models, but a ways of rethinking aspects of technology, using them in the context of the SAMR model as well as some of the work related to Black, what we're going to be playing with today. Excellent, excellent. Well, as always, I benefit from your knowledge um, and uh, your, your very good sense of play and creativity. Um, you know, I've got these slides up here and I actually need to put them on. Should I explain uh, what a Black Swan is first, Ruben, or do you want to do that? Why I do a very brief introduction for people who haven't heard about Black Swans? A Black Swan event is an event that happens and has three key characteristics. The first one, it's not predictable. It's nothing that you could have predicted ahead of time. In other words, knowing more or less, you couldn't have predicted it. However, the second aspect that they always have is you may not have been able to predict it, but you can explain it retrospectively. In other words, you can say, well, that happened. Okay, I can predict it. Ah, but now that it's happened, now retrospectively, I can understand why it happened. And the third aspect that it has is that it changes everything. So Black Swan events are not just the kind of thing that you go, eh, nobody cares, but really the kind of event, the kind of thing where you say, oh, wow, that really did change the rules of the game. It really did change things. The most common example that you'll find people using for Black Swans is uh, usually you talk about things like the Titanic. The Titanic, nobody predicted ahead of time, could have predicted ahead of time what was going to happen to it. And nobody, uh, I know you hear some of these stories about somebody had a vision, et cetera, but the same person was having visions about every ship out there, so not exactly a prediction mm -hmm. that it was going to sink. So it couldn't predict that it was going to happen. Once it happened, of course, you've got you know dozens of books on why the whole event happened. And it changed everything. It changed shipping rules. It changed... Uh, rules about radio transmitters, it changed rules about safety on ships. It completely overnight changed how the landscape of shipping and people uh, being transported and goods being transported, etc., cetera, uh, was configured in the world. So that's an example of a Black Swan event. So it's those three characteristics. Can't predict it ahead of time. You can explain it retrospectively. And then uh, it changes everything once it happens. Yeah, I, I really nicely said. I mean, for me, some of my favorite examples are the 2008 financial crash. Uh, you know, the consensus of the financial world in the in the autumn of 2008 was everything was fine. 
Um, you could think about September 11th, which is, you know, real bolts from the blue. And I think almost every world religion actually appears as this kind of black swan. Um, uh, in the chat, by the way, uh, Ruben, we have some, I'm going to interpret this as admiring text about, uh, about our beards. So that, that's, that's very good. Um, the, uh, okay. uh, so we have prepared uh, two different uh, black swan events for everyone. Uh, and what we'd like you to do is we'd like you to role play how you would respond to them. And you can play either as yourself, that is who you are right now in the current position you have. So if you're a professor, if you're a president, a trustee, a student, a technologist, a publisher, whatever role you have right now, or the role you'd like to have. So if you're a dean and you'd like to be president, think about yourself as a president. If you're you know, an adjunct professor and you'd like to be a full-time one, think about yourself in that way. Um, well, let me, uh, let me start putting these up. In fact, let me uh, rearrange the screen just a little bit here um, so that we can see things a little more clearly. And let's roll out the first one. And keep in mind, everyone, that we have not revealed this to you before. So uh, any surprise, confusion, questions you have are all part of the game which has begun now. So the first scenario is called the corn mosaic virus. And in fact, let me just zoom in on the screen a bit here and make it a bit easier to read. And let me explain what we're talking about. It's the year 2020 something. Uh, and everyone was concerned about bird flu, about new COVID variants and all kinds of pandemics that affected the animal kingdom. However, it wasn't animals that were in the path of the next black swan, it was plants. In the June of 2020 something, a rapidly spreading new corn mosaic virus emerged in the US. That June was unusually hot and dry. So early warning signals were taken as a sign of heat stress and the ongoing impact of climate change. However, it quickly became clear that a new virus was responsible for wilting crops. Despite desperate measures, burning down huge amounts of planted acreage, quarantining affected regions, the season's crop was effectively wiped out in a couple of weeks. Now, losing one third of world corn production had immediate effects on the world's markets. The price of both corn and soy shot up by around 15%. Fossil fuels likewise increased in price by a smaller amount. Fortunately, the virus did not spread outside the USA that season. Even Canada and Mexico remained unaffected. The impact made it felt, felt rapidly in the USA. Prices for beef, pork, and chicken went up by around 7%, and the corn-producing states from their GDP dropped by as much as 6%. State budgets were affected immediately, and state education funding was one of the first things legislators looked to cut. Now, there's plenty of finger pointing involved here. Populist attacks on land grant universities, uh, being too focused on liberal arts, resulting in fund cutting and congressional hearing. Uh, ag departments seeing and seizing opportunities for funding boosts, but risking collegial condemnation for riding the populist wave. Their protests about food and gas prices, targeting various lenses of government, agribusiness, and the climate change policy community. There are also darker shades to some of these complaints, with muttering and congressional hearings about a foreign origin for the virus. Multiple political culprits were floated, with motivations ranging from an attack on the USA economy to a desire to raise the prices of corn and soy, so experts, to a eco-terrorist attack on king corn. Now, of course, these conspiracy theories have only become more complex and arcane when the virus, excuse me, when the next planting season, China found its corn crop overrun by a new strain of the virus. So, Ruben, how should people be responding and thinking right now? Well, here's the idea then. This is the black swan scenario. And we have a couple of additional slides. So if you put the next slide on, Brian, this is, in case you don't, corn states, if you will, in the United States. These are the biggest planters, the biggest the states that depend the most upon corn production. Okay? So you want to be thinking about the, you're in a role in academia. What do you know, or maybe you are in one of these states, about the relationship of your institution to one of these states? And in addition to that, what would change? What would happen? How would you react? What do you think should happen? What could happen? If we go to the next slide, we have then 
the aspect of how is corn used. And you have to understand that in case you aren't familiar with this in the States, and there's no reason why you should be, most of the corn does not go to human uh, feeding directly. In fact, almost none of it does. Most of it goes primarily to cattle for, uh, feeding of one form or another. Uh, a, also pork, also chickens, but just general animal feed. Much of the rest then goes to ethanol and other fuel equivalent production. And then the rest of it is exported to other countries where, by the way, the destination tends to be much as we've described. Most of this, again, is not for human consumption. So think about that in terms of what you look at in academe, in terms of what you look at in terms of your world, in terms of what happens, in terms of what you're involved in, what your institution is involved in. How will this shift? How will this shift like this? How would suddenly losing this change how you think about things? And if we do the last slide then for this one, what we have here is what happens in the rest of the world. Because, of course, you're knocking out the U.S., and that's roughly one-third of the world's uh, corn production. But then take a look at these numbers over here. China is the second largest producer, but it's also the uh, second largest consumer. And, in fact, it still needs to import a little bit of its production. It, it doesn't quite cover all the corn it needs. Then you have other. And then you have countries in interesting places, like Brazil, for instance, is a major producer. But if you look at the list below the nice little pie chart, you'll find that Ukraine, Argentina, South Africa, all of these countries, India, are also major producers. Again, India is a major consumer as well. But differentially, India does have a slight surplus. So how does this change in terms of international relationships with institutions in these countries? What might happen? What students might travel, what they might be interested in? So that's the type of thing. So again, just giving you a little bit of a context for what feeds into a black swan. And what I'd like to encourage you to do now is I'm going to be quiet and I'm going to encourage you all to type into the chat space or ask our good host here if you would like to come on stage and talk. You know, uh, in fact, our good host can bring on multiple people on stage if they are so inclined. So you can test out some of these ideas because that's the purpose of this exercise. To get some of these ideas on the table, to cash them out, to, you know, face off different approaches, different thoughts about this. And we can talk a little bit more later towards the end of the session about the type of thing that a Black Swan exercise can do. So, Brian, I'll turn it back over to you. Well, thank you. Uh, do you want me to keep the slide up or no? Uh, if you'd like, it's actually probably the most useful one in terms of people being curious about what happens in the world okay. around corn. Well, we have uh, in the chat box, we've had some very good observations. Um, we had uh, the very sad one from Stephen Crawford. He says, goodbye bourbon, um, which is uh, it's a good way of thinking uh, to see the, you know, the dominoes begin to fall. Uh, Tom Hames uh, has uh, two observations. One is that he didn't know that China grew that much corn. And this is one of the great things about a scenario is that it can make you start learning and researching more stuff. But Tom also noted this interesting knock-on effect. If this wiped out ethanol, that would be a good thing. Um, Lisa Durf has a, a short-term observation or a question, and maybe Ruben, you want to uh, address this. If feed is wiped out, there'd be many animal carcasses. What gases do they emit? That's a great question. So if feed is wiped out, what you're very likely to see is an early slaughter of animals. Not pretty, but that's exactly what would be likely to happen. You'd likely see greater demand on uh, refrigeration facilities. And if not enough was available, then you'd likely see a lot of the cattle being uh, going downfield, so to speak, to things like, uh, well, ranging from dog food and so on. In other words, immediately processable material to uh, just being reused as fertilizer or something like that. But you do have a good point uh, to make. In other words, the increase in refrigeration facilities would likely lead to an increase in greenhouse gases due to additional energy demand. And in fact, the processing of all of these cattle, uh, you know, carcasses, etc., does indeed introduce some additional greenhouse gases, some of that in the form of methane as a byproduct of some of these processes, some of it in the form of just good old CO2 from uh, burning fossil fuels. But it's an excellent knock-on effect to think about. It really is. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Brent Presley uh, points out that some livestock can transition to grazing, but not all of them. Uh, 
So we would have some of that. Uh, and then we then we have some more knock on effects that are very, very interesting. Uh, Charles Finley says, if it only affects corn, then we can certainly make sure that everyone pivots to a plant based diet. Uh, it's a good observation thinking about what most of the corn actually goes to. Um, uh, Karen Watts says that this should this should push innovation in the ag industry as well as the energy industry. So Again, we're seeing knock on effects in different domains and different domains. Uh, Brent Presley asked a really good question. Uh, wheat, barley, and oats are closely related to corn. Are we certain that they are safe for the next season? Very good observation. Um, and Anna yep. Epic and I'll, yep, sorry, I just want to jump in on that one because that's a great one. And if for one second we do a back pivot, if you will, to incorporating things that we learned during the COVID pandemic, remember one of the places that was intriguing was when suddenly we started finding other animals because infected with COVID and either becoming reservoirs or themselves uh, um, suffering the effects of COVID. So that question of, wait, these other crops are related. Could they also be affected? Is an excellent one to think of as potential, again, successive effects after the first wave. Indeed. And here, I'm just going to pivot back to the map for a second, because uh, we have a couple of questions about geography. Um, we have uh, Annie Epperson. Hello, Annie, who says, in her part of Colorado, the U.S., the impact on both the beef industry when employ lots of sorry, which employs lots of folks. So double hit on tax revenue that supports your university. So, so we're seeing another impact straight into higher education. Uh, Tom asks how much CO2 is created by corn production, which is a good thing to think of. And then Neil Geisel uh, has a, just a really great narrative here. My mind goes to thinking about stakeholders who are most significantly impacted, crosswalking to identify where our campus expertise might help different highly impacted groups, and then walking through the change management required to mobilize rapid, I think he was going to say mapping responses, um, which is which is brilliant. Um, do, you, do, you, do we want to just push people to think now about some of them, uh, say a bit more about the impact on higher education where they are? I think so. I, I'd like to hear more from people. Again, just think of where you're at or where you would like to be. And what you would see as the impact across the, across the board. It can be everything from curriculum to funding to student populations, you name it. I can think of knock-on effects in just about every single aspect of academia, but I'm more interested in hearing what all of you th have to say or think. Oh, excellent. And folks, you're all on the, on the chat doing great. If you'd like to either join us on stage, we can host a couple of you. Just click the raise hand button. Or if you want us to display a text and want me to read it out loud, Put it in the uh, Q and A box. Um, oh, there's all kinds of ideas here. Um, uh, James Boswell says we have to locate food sources and other ways to feed livestock, find ways to eradicate the virus. Uh, and any oh, good, any has had more uh, with the drop in ethanol production would reinvigorate the petroleum industry for fuel and for tax revenue. Um, there are more comments on bourbon, um, including Steve Crawford says that the reductions in bourbon in his state of Kentucky would reduce tax revenue. And that happened historically before. That happened uh, during Prohibition. So again, that has a knock-on effect on, on higher education. Uh, Noah Geisel, I would love to hear uh, some more of, your, uh, more of your ideas, especially on either of those points. Uh, Deborah Penner says that her rural Kansas uh, college would be drastically affected. Many of our donors and students are farm-based or ag income-based. It would encourage the demise of smaller Kansas towns and small colleges. I, I love this. Uh, so donors, this is a crucial part of higher education in the United States. So if their wealth is based in agriculture and it gets hit, donations then take a hit. And then your students are farm-based. So I, I'm, I'm curious, Deborah, do you think you'd see students um, requesting more in financial aid or would they be dropping out? Um, you know, run with this a little bit further. Uh, Lisa hoarding bourbon, very smart. Um, and uh, Deborah Penner responds to Tom's earlier point about ethanol, saying those who despise ethanol need to be reminded how this would affect economic survival in the central states. So again, there's a big theme here of, of geography where we're looking at these states that are most closely impacted. Uh, Mike Ricicci says, in the U.S. corn regions, uh, many farms would convert to beets. Mm, good thinking. Good thinking. Um, Jonathan Beals uh, has a couple of questions. Increase in public support for farm subsidies. 
that's a really good point. That's a key part of American agriculture since the 1930s. Or would public demand, I'm sorry, with the public demand, more diversification of production to accompany that, right? So the taxpayers say, all right, if we're going to you know, increase their subsidies to keep you all going, are we going to demand that you move to beets and, and other, other plants? Uh, Tom Hames says the college research facility should be well-placed to help industries to pivot away from corn. Europe lives on far less corn than we do even today. And then Mike Ricci comes back by saying replacing high fructose corn syrup, I hope I've got that right, with beet or cane sucrose is only one part of the industrial corn spectrum. Corn starch, corn oil, dextrose all come from corn and alternatives would be needed. I see this is great. And when you, when you start picking at the different parts of a scenario like this, you start to see all the different connections beginning to get pulled on as well. Uh, Catherine Bailey says, we currently have surplus in the industry. So saying we produce less in the U.S. may not be a crisis at all. However, globally, I could see the losses that could be a boon for the U.S. to make funds, but could be part of a breadbasket war brewing. Uh, Catherine, this is great. I love that. I mean, not that I'm happy about a war brewing, but I think these great observations. I mean, you're digging into the data, you're focusing on how this would impact the U.S. and then bring up the geopolitical implications. Very, very good. Uh, Annie Epperson points out the different water demands between beets and corn would be a sensitive point here in Colorado. This is great. So if we move from the Midwest towards the American West, the West is much drier, and this is definitely an issue. Thank you, Annie, for bringing up water politics. Uh, and Deborah Penner uh, posits that the loss of corn acres would promote more use of wheat and development. Oh, very interesting, Deborah. Uh, this is, we're going great guns here so far. Uh, Ruben, did, did you want to uh, jump in at this point? Yeah, just a quick comment because several of the comments that have come in in this latter section, uh, again, highlight something that to me is really important. One of the really useful things that can come out of uh, Black Swan thinking and doing this type of Black Swan scenario, and that's thinking about trade-offs. In other words, I, I'm seeing lots of very interesting ideas, right? Let's just take one, for instance. Let's say you talk about, well, well if we convert at least some of that to uh, beet sugar or beet planting for sugar, right? And we need uh, replacements for HFC. But uh, uh, one of the things is that, of course, beets as a profit maker, the profit margin on beets is much lower mm. than on corn. So there's a question of saying, okay, if we're going to ask for that, are we going to subsidize the beets? Because frankly, a lot of most sugar planting around the world of that type is subsidized in one form or another, whether it's sugar cane or beets. And if so, what's our trade of how much do we want to replace? How much would we like to go in a different direction? In other words, there is no such thing as a perfect solution. They're thinking about, well, where's, where's our end goal? What are the trade-offs that we'd like to make? And this is where Black Swan thinking really can help you because using these models where you suddenly have these situations you're not saying well it's abstracted i don't know what happened here you have to say okay given these parameters what are the different constructs that we can make to address this or something like that and they will always involve a trade-off but mm -hmm. the more we think about this the more the elements of the trade-off become more visible mm -hmm. it, i am really really impressed i'm really happy with what people are contributing here Oh, thank you for saying that. Um, thank you for saying all that. The trade-offs are really, really important. And and the ideas keep coming. Uh, let me just bring up a few of these. Uh, Deborah Penner uh, points out something I've never heard of. The loss of corn acres would promote more use, sorry, more use of wheat and development of kurza, which is a wheat grass that does not need to be re-sown each year. My husband and son, who are wheat and kurza activists, growers, and promoters in Kansas and Minnesota. So this takes us up north. So again, you know, working through the black swan brings in more information. Uh, Deborah also asked us to check out the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas. So we've got an interesting academic source. Uh, Christina, hello, Christina, uh, points out that students who are from families that are affected by bad crops and don't get any revenue won't be able to go to university as easily because they're lacking funding. So we see a knock-on effect in enrollment. Uh, Deborah Penner suggests that students will drop out or go to Kansas State or Kansas University. Now, Neil, this is, a, this is great. I love how you're bringing in your lives and your professions here. And then Neil takes, oh, sorry, Noah takes it a little further. Since his role is dedicated to micro-credentials, I wonder about CU, uh, 
Colorado University Boulder, if it might rapidly respond with authoritative trusted learning modules that would credential badges focused on what individuals can do meaningfully to respond to the crisis. Oh, very interesting idea. You might get a, you know, a, a Kurza badge, right? Depending. Um, uh, Deborah Penner says she has Kurza flower in her pantry right now. Uh, and then Tom pivots back to ethanol and says it uses more energy and creates more CO2 than it saves. We need to figure out how to pivot away from a corn-based world. The U.S. needs to diversify its crops away from corn. And Tom, maybe this event would be a, a way of doing that. In fact, maybe, Ruben, we have a conspiracy theory saying that uh, this was a, um, a biological attack created by certain agencies who are trying to increase that very effect. Um, Noah continues, uh, I'm saying a micro-credential example, local ways of creating non-corn-based feed sources that can immediately save livestock and long-term nudge towards more sustainable pollutions feed practices. Oh, this is good stuff. Uh, Mike Ricicci goes back to uh, another campus and says, many, most college campuses have beverage exclusivity contracts with one of the major soft drink manufacturers, Coke or Pepsi, both of whom would be profoundly impacted Prices might change, institutional revenues might decrease. Uh, this is a great point. And Vanessa, hello, Vanessa. And you're, you're pretty close to this train yourself. Points out we're exploring alternate oil seeds. Oh, great stuff. And Will Emerson, hello, speaking of the Midwest. For the community services, such as career fairs, continuing education courses, food banks, and so on, are increasingly part of the mission of many institutions. As someone living and working in a corn state, this would further stretch our resources as we respond to vastly increased demands from our rural community members. Uh, this is just terrific. Uh, Deborah Penner mentions that her son grows and promotes camellia seed in, Minis in Minneapolis. This is, or sorry, Minnesota. That's another sustainable crop. Very interesting. Uh, and then Brent uh, comes back in. And by, by the way, I just want to mention Brent is coming to us from uh, Armenia. We also have um, another person coming to us from Brisbane, Australia, and we have someone from, from Alaska. So we have a, a truly global uh, forum today. Uh, Brent says that he suspects our demand for high fructose corn sugar is inflexible. So we probably have to subsidize beet production. Very interesting. Right. Um, oh, there's just, there's more and more of this. Right? Ruben, do, do, you, do you want to wrap this up? Um, uh, or have any comments on this before we plunge into the next scenario? I think, you know, I'm just looking at the text chat. And by the way, uh, I know you normally ask for this, but I, I think I'll uh, add my voice here. If people are willing to share this, I would love to be able to share this out after uh, we're done with this session because there's a wealth of ideas and information coming through. And I'm just going to, just for wrapping this one up, and yes, I agree, I think we should move on to the next one, even though we could obviously spend the rest of today on this. Uh, one of the things that I see coming up, for instance, is, is Stephen, Stephen Crawford, for instance, said, I wonder about the fire risk from the drying corn stalks that are not economically worth cutting down after they die. Could we have enormous wildfires across the breadbasket? Oh, and so yeah. you start seeing feedback loops on other sources yes. because that one feeds straight into climate change and we know that wildfires have become more likely and more virulent than harder to control right but now you have something that has potentially the stress of climate change might have had something to do with the origins of the virus but now you have a feedback loop that worsens some of the impact of climate change so again this you also want to be looking for these feedback loops where unexpectedly suddenly something that might have had a partial cause in climate change worsens the effects of climate change. Mm. And again, as you're responding to it, what do you do to try to offset? That? How do you balance what you're doing in different areas? Because it's unlikely you'll be able to address all the different crises to the same degree all at once. So what's your trade-off? Again, so this is yet another area where I think I, I really like that one. I, I, I think... I love to close on that one because it gives you again the type of thinking that you'd like to see coming out of yes, indeed. analysis of black swan scenarios. Uh, I, I agree completely. So let let me, me move on to the next one. Yeah, let me just quickly pull out two comments before we do that. Uh, one from our good friend Roxanne Riskin points out that this will literally directly cause food insecurity among students. 
So we haven't mentioned that so far. That's a really, really important one to mention. And then uh, Jonathan Beal gives us a nice transition. He says, uh, shock events punctuate the importance of lifeboat contingency plans that will reduce the traumatic impacts until a new equilibrium is found. What lifeboat planning would have been good for a scenario like this? Excellent thinking, Jonathan. And that's the transition awesome. to our, our next scenario. So you're thinking about lifeboats, you're thinking about knock-on effects and trade-offs. Well, let's take a look at this one um, here. This one has an unusual name. Uh, this is called the Academic Panama Car Wash of 2020X. What is this about? Well, let's explain here. In this year, 2020X, members of the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, the ICEIJ, received tips about a new international money laundering operation. In form and function, they blended elements of the Panama Papers, which is laundering and hiding illegal funds, and of the Odebrecht, aka the car wash case, which had bribes paid to officials for signing contracts. However, the operation had a few additional distinctive characteristics. It featured more criminal organizations among its clientele and a very specific endpoint for funds and influence peddling endowments at American higher education institutions. Now, initial rumors were met with vehement denials from higher education, but an unrelated crypto fraud investigation coordinated by Interpol led to the unearthing of a trove of evidence pointing to a range of troubling practices at several academic universities. With encouragement from bipartisan congressional committees, whistleblowers stepped forward to denounce practices ranging from looking the other way, to implicitly peddling access in exchange for funds, to actively soliciting and seeking out connected shady donors. In this process, several big donor names were found to be linked to the operation network, although all disclaimed knowledge of its existence. Higher Ed struck back at Congress in the investigations, claiming that actual involvement was marginal at best, and the whole hearing process was designed to distract from, by involvement from some politicians, as well as to fuel support for legislative controls and higher education funding. But regardless of the veracity or falsity of some of these claims, the impact this had on student and family decisions, as well as on donors, was undeniable. Now, do you want to walk us through this uh, infographic? Yep. Yep. So if in the previous Black Swan scenario, we were looking at systems, right? We were looking at interrelated systems. Here, we're looking at something more like networks and or more, so I would say, intimately related to how networks interact and how suddenly having networks grow bigger than a certain amount or have more complexity to them suddenly creates new things. So here I'm going to show you in the next two slides. Uh, the first one shows you what the Panama Papers look like. Now, the Panama Papers were mostly about how you created shell companies, shell corporations to hide illegal funds, whether it was tax evasion or something else, right? And this diagram shows you how internationally you have these interconnected shell corporations. So again, people think of the shell corporation that everything is put into. And this diagram shows you, in fact, no, it's, it's a network. And there are intermediaries that do not themselves constitute endpoint shell operations, maybe more or less legit, but serve a crucial role in facilitating bridging the network of operations. And again, you'll have all these slides. There's a couple of papers on the topic. I strongly recommend reading them. So that's the Panama Papers. But if we look at the next one, we'll see a different type of network. And this is two slides illustrating aspects of the Odebrecht network. Now, Odebrecht was a bribes operation for the company for Odebrecht, pay a, a public official, get a project, considered, moved up the ladder, etc. right? Get oversight shifted, whatever was necessary. The amazing thing about Odebrecht, why people were fascinated by it, was the complexity of it. You tend to have this image of, okay, company goes and puts a lot of money in the hand of a certain member of Congress or oversight official, whatever, and then something happens. But again, what you had here was a vastly complex network of people interacting with other peoples, with agencies, and so on. So the top left is Odebrecht overall, and it's hugely complex. So if you look at just one one small aspect of Odebrecht, and this is the network that you see in the lower right-hand corner associated with Toledo, a former president of Peru. You see the type of thing you get. You get networks of interaction, but it's not as simple as, again, somebody from Odebrecht going up to the Toledo and saying, here you go, have some money, let my project go through, and that's it. You have things like state capture, 
for instance, state organization capture as being a sub-network essential to what's happening here. You have different elements of the family. You have different, if you will, quasi-corporate entities, although they form spontaneously as a result of the networks. So this is what you're thinking about. When you're thinking about this black swan, don't think about one person goes up to one school official and says, here you go, have a lot of money. Now, can you get me influence with these other donors to your endowment? Or here you go, I have some illegal money. I'm going to buy the park it if you allow me to use your endowment as a laundering fund. Think more about the type of network that can emerge where even when people are trying to keep things honest, uh, they, can't, they can't really control all of the pieces of the network. And yet they can find themselves being one of these nodes, one of these elements in the network. So, Ryan, over to you. Well, so let's, here is the black swan. So we, we have this, this enormous uh, networked event, basically, um, which gets uh, opened out to the whole world. Higher education is involved in uh, illegal money laundering, as well as uh, links to uh, some unsavory characters. How does that play out in higher education? And also, how does it play out in the overall world? Think about what we just did with the uh, corn plague. How do, what are the dominoes that fall uh, once we see this? And also, you know, what questions do you have about how the academic Panama car wash would work out? We had, uh, we had uh, Jonathan Thiel beat everyone to the moment with the uh, Casablanca reference. I'm shocked, shocked, I tell you, that the endowment complex of U.S. higher education should be susceptible to such shenanigans. Uh, so he got us to that. Uh, Noah Geisel points out something very, very interesting. At the Badge Summit next month, we had a couple of sessions that were tracking notions of trust networks specific to digital credential ecosystems. How do we leverage networks to enhance trust and give our stakeholders to thrive because of boosted credential trust? The lady points out that Aristotle State University Trusted Learn Network is working on a lot of this stuff. Uh, what would you do with that? So thinking about the, the, the networks here of corruption and then the networks of trust for uh, credentials, what do these two say to each other? That's a great, absolutely great point. And in fact, I'm going to reference the two papers that I cited uh, in the bibliography that accompanies the slides. No need to look at them right this minute. Okay. But there is a discussion of exactly how to build up trust networks to offset or what type of trust networks can be built. So we have a double aspect. Your, uh, the intuition that Noah brings to the table is absolutely right. A trust network is the best way to deal with this. A simple way of saying, well, look, you know, make sure that your compliance officer at your university that oversees the trust does X, Y, and Z doesn't work when you have situations as complex as this, because there's too many pieces in the puzzle. There's too many intermediaries. There's too many networks involved. In other words, this exceeds that. that but you can construct trust networks and and again, these pa the papers that I feature have, and to use those to leverage. So you can use them directly. But I also would point to about what academia can do. Building in the idea of trust networks as something you leverage habitually, like, like what we're talking with academic credentials and so on, starts to build the ground for saying, okay, I am used to this in this domain of my life. Can I bring it into other domains? Mm -hmm in useful ways. So mm -hmm. thank you, Noah, that's, that's a great point. It's almost a network literacy idea. Um, brilliant, brilliant. Um, Jonathan uh, Beals adds another one. I remember to hear, of, I'm gonna mispronounce this, uh, Olafimi Otaiwo and his elite capture. Networks involved in higher education are well connected, especially in the development spaces. Where, where do you go with, Jonathan, with that, Jonathan? Do you think that there may this may have knock-on effects of revealing further unsavory connections? Uh, or do you think this might uh, burn some of those trust networks and get donors to stop donating so much? Uh, Tom Hames uh, raises a really, really good point. And this brings us right back to Gaza. Uh, he ventriloquizes some saying, quote, we can't divest from insert country or cause because we don't know where all our investments are going, unquote. So he asks, do we have a trust network in endowment funding now? A very good question. Um, and then Mike Ricicci asked the question, aren't these interconnections of money laundering and secret sharing themselves trust networks? Ruben, do you want to do a quick answer to that one? Well, 
It, so the answer is yes. Again, uh, when you're looking at, uh, you know, what you've got in terms of what's going on. Yes, absolutely right. And you'll see this, for instance, in studies that have been made of things like uh, drug trafficking, for instance. There is very much a scenario where people are indeed going on, ah, yes, we've built up a trust network among these criminal organizations that I trust. This one will move my drug shipment without taking a chunk off the top that they're not allowed to take or this one will launder the money and only take the percentage that we've agreed, et cetera. So absolutely, there is in fact a form of trust network operating. And this is again, a, a topic for very active study. And I keep coming back to the idea of saying, the more we can get the idea of thinking in networks, thinking about trust networks, thinking about how they can operate for all sorts of different purposes, the more we can build this into what's happening in higher ed. I think the more we'll start to see interesting patterns, interesting ways of thinking about this that we might not otherwise have seen. So, yeah. this, is, this is fascinating, uh, Ruben, how we didn't start this exercise by saying, let's think about networks, but now we're starting to think in a pretty sophisticated way about how to research networks, about how one network can learn from another. Uh, this, this is excellent. Uh, we have another question for you. This is from uh, our excellent friend, Ed Webb, uh, professor at Dickinson College who asks, is this a difference in kind or merely scale of the various kinds of washing that openly goes on at the richer, more prestigious U.S. higher education institutions? It, it would be, in this case, more than just a change in scale. It would be a change in kind. And again, this is why Panama Papers and Odebrecht made such a big splash in the world of you know people ranging from sociologists to criminologists to everybody because they were not just big networks of traditional structures they started to create whole new structures for laundering money for bribing in other words some of these structures the others have other breath is so complex that you still have cases going on where nobody's quite even sure all of the intermediaries who knew what when how who was a patsy who was a knowing pawn, who was a willing pawn. There's all sorts of different players in the network that make it a beast that it's huge, of course. And you're right, there's a scale issue, but there's also a kind issue. You really start to see, that's why it's a black swan. You start to see completely different behaviors. In other words, look, it's not like we haven't seen plenty of uh, scandals along the lines of, I give you this much money, my kid gets into the sports team, right? We saw that over and over again a few years ago. But that's still on a different, it's not just a bigger version of that. It's a much more complex landscape that, again, allows for all sorts of different phenomena to occur that could not occur otherwise. Mm, mm. Uh, that's a rich answer. Ed, thank you for that great clarifying question. That's one of the things we get to do yeah. in an exercise like this is to ask that to tease out how the scenario actually works. Uh, we have... Um, an, a very, very interesting prompt. And I, I, I'd like, to, if I could, for everyone to think about this one. Noah Geisel says, specific to this black swan, I wonder what the lessons we can learn from the Panama Papers. Despite evidence that abuses were clearly going on, whoop, hang on a second. Uh, despite evidence that abuses were clearly damning, everybody moved on and consequences were scant. How might higher education respond with accountability or restoring faith? What, what do you think, Ruben? And what do you think everybody involved here? Uh, what are some of the ways higher education might uh, take responsibility or try to evade responsibility? I think I'm going to put that question more to the participants because I, I can think of several different ways, right? But the point about Panama Papers and relative degrees of responsibility and who, who paid what price for what is indeed an intriguing one and it's, it's a very good question, right? If you wanted a certain measure of accountability, a certain measure of et cetera, uh, then you would have to uh, build in new mechanism. But I'm interested in here what could be those mechanisms. What type of mechanisms could we be in the chat group? Yeah, I suggest... I, I would think offhand um, that we might see a bunch of legal moves taken by some U.S. states, 
So I'm, I'm thinking about perhaps states where they have uh, some of these universities. So think about Massachusetts, for example, or California uh, or New York. Uh, and the state governments might take actions against those universities. I could imagine the, the federal government taking actions, at least doing hearings about this and trying to do more. Um, and I can imagine quite a few um, uh, universities trying to distance themselves and explain, you know, well, just because we're connected by degrees of separation, we weren't actually part of this. And our, our foundation, our hedge funds do, you know, a great amount of work in supporting students and so on. Oh, we do have some uh, more thoughts have come in. Uh, Charles Finley asks, what about the major agribusiness executives supporting research or different types of products, such as GMO, to connect from the corn black swan? The findings support the industry behind it. Are the universities accountable for the results? Nice, Charles. I like the way you cross hash that back to the first one. Uh, Ed Webb uh, gets even darker. Perhaps in corruption, as in politics, the Overton window gets moved by events such as the Panama Papers, car wash, state capture of South Africa, and the formerly unacceptable becomes routine after a few risks get slapped and the rest walk away unscathed. Mm, 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 mm. Uh, Catherine Bailey adds in, there's a phenomenon that met public perception makes you a villain if you have the ability to control, but victim if perceived that you have no control. Might be a PR war. Mm, great point, Catherine. I could, I could definitely see dueling PR agencies trying to emit chaff in all directions. Uh, Brent Presley weighs in by saying, with regard to avoiding accountability, it feels like people or organizations with a lot of money almost always escape accountability. With the size of the endowments that are out there, I suspect the same would happen. Oh, this is great stuff. Uh, Steve, oh. Now Steve Crawford takes another domino and clicks it over. What if it entangles state retirement funds as well? Those are based in investments. Oh, very, very good one. I mean, I don't mean good as in happy and beneficial. I mean, it's a really great connection to draw. Uh, Vahid imagines a geology professor willingly or forcibly providing data that helps find a good location for a drug plantation. Oh, nice one. Ed, I wonder if that would fall within the new Overton window there. Uh, Steve Crawford says states might not want to implicate themselves. Uh, and then Noah Geisel says, by example, someone mentioned Epstein. At MIT, my understanding is that they fired uh, Etho. Joey Etho was the head of the, um, of the lab there. And counted that as an appropriate response. Mm -hmm. Performative? Hollow? Could black swan responses be less about crisis communications, more about ways of responding that align with our missions? Oh, it's a great call, Noah. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Um, Ruben, there are a few more. Should I keep going or do you want to jump in? Uh, no, just a very, again, I, I love what the people are pointing out in the comments. And one of the things is, I, I love the question of the state retirement funds because that's exactly right. You know, people tend to forget that some of the biggest players in the investment market organizations like CalPERS, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, of course, many of the large universities, university systems, etc. You know, when your endowment is multiple billion dollars in size, uh, you're a great target for all sorts of indirect uh, effects, indirect. It, it becomes interesting in and of itself as a way to influence other investments, for instance. Suppose it's known that you have a major position in a particular segment of an industry. If you wanted to influence said industry, you might decide that a great way to do it would be to target the endowment via a network such as what we're looking at here. Now, you could say, well, geez, uh, what am I supposed to do with my endowment? That's a very good question. You need to have an idea for effects like this how you would look for somebody trying to effectively go through your endowment by affecting it with a suitably sizable donation to shift something in an industry as a result, say, of a desire for a certain company to be benefited, equivalent of a bribe, except now routed in a rather interesting way. Oh, this, is, this is very, very good. Uh, I like how this black swan cuts through society at a different level or a different trajectory uh, and is leading us to different connections. Uh, 
Jonathan Beale points out to Catherine that the irony being that modern complexity is both a boon and an excuse for elites. Quote, I am the only person who can deal with this complexity before crisis, and then afterwards, how can you blame me? It was such a complex problem. Nobody could have foreseen this afterwards. Um, Mike Ricicci adds uh, the TIAA CREF uh, account, uh, or that whole enterprise uh, being impacted. Very, very good call, given how that services a lot of people in uh, teaching and uh, cultural heritage organizations. Um, Jonathan Beale goes on, the constant whiplash between confidence and confusion is likely one big reason for loss of institutional trust. So we might see uh, trust go deeply down the drain about this. Uh, Catherine Bailey says a larger, more real scenario will crop up after election. Depending on how it goes and state funds and investments that support companies aligned in politicized social supports might put a higher education institution into the crosshairs of a political debate. Oh, very, very good one, Catherine. Um, you know, I, I've seen this happen a few times over the past couple of years where in uh, Connecticut, for example, uh, state officials will put up the idea of taxing endowments that are over several billion dollars, uh, which will just mean one institution uh, when they say that. So yeah, this could become a, a political, this could drive further uh, political uh, policy making at higher education. And Tom adds that this is an information overload example. Very, very true. Uh, Ruben, we're, we're down to the last four minutes of our hour. Uh, would you like to pursue this one a little further or do you want to try drawing things together? What would you like? I think we're at a good point to draw things together, uh, Brian. So here's what I was going to say. First, I want to thank everybody for participating and please keep on typing into the chat. As I said, uh, you know, we, we will be sharing this uh, if people have no objections, analyzing it as well, trying to extract some themes. And I just want to highlight a couple of additional things. So, you know, the Black Swan scenarios like this, first, the ones that you have here, folks, these are free. Feel free. We will make, of course, all of the slides resources available. So please feel free to take them, use them, modify them in whichever way you would like at your institution. In any way they are useful to you, that it's it's important that they get used. That's how they become useful. So, But the other thing about Black Swan scenarios is they can lead to several different things. One is trying to build anti-fragility, right? The type of institutional resources or personal in some scenarios, which allow you to go through a black swan event and come out the other side of it. Not just, well, we kind of just limp through, but actually come out with, you know, not unaffected, but at the very least with new capacities, new capabilities you didn't have before. So that's one of the uses, but there are two other uses I wanted to highlight that we've actually heard them both come up in the discussion, which is absolutely great. Because a second use is for what I would call the aspect of seeing the networks, seeing the systems, starting to see these connections, trade-offs, intersections that you might not have thought about to look for even beforehand. And we've seen just many of those, and I've seen some amazing stuff that I'm going, ha, ah, I haven't thought of that in terms of these two scenarios. So seeing the systems, seeing the networks, seeing the connections, seeing the trade-offs, the knock-on effects, etc. All of that is another important aspect. And there's a third one. And that came up, I think, in the context of here with the trust networks, which is this also helps you using these uh, black swan scenarios to bring up discussions for community. Because the type of responses you would like to build to build anti-fragility and institution, and Tom highlighted this, and a couple of other people highlighted this, I think it was Jonathan as well, in this, you don't want the person on top saying, I know everything that has to be done I will tell you how to do it because not only do they generally not know, but in fact, you can wind up in a worse situation with that. So you want to talk about how you build up community understanding, community discussions, so that you can find approaches, processes you might not have before. And this type of conversation around Black Swan scenarios is a great way to start at least some of that community building process, those explorations, thinking about this, what you could do. So just wanted to put those things in closing on the table. Oh, excellent. Um, Thank I, I, you all. I think the, uh, the, the intensity of conversation that's been going back and forth really shows to uh, shows us all of that kind of uh, community and networking. Um, 
and uh, just you know, a few more comments that have come up. Uh, Catherine Bailey says, as a planner, I try to get everyone to see that it is not always a negative look. Look for opportunities to leverage. Uh, very, very true. Um, and Juliet uh, Bentley in Australia, where it is, I think, dawn now, says the teachers are looking at AI and implications here. So this is, an, I think, this kind of shocking black swan event uh, exercise gives you a nice way of looking at implications for other things that are non-black swans. Uh, and then uh, Ed Webb tossed us a good uh, example of um, a potential way of responding to this uh, car wash panel paper story uh, from his state of Pennsylvania, um, where there's an attempt to uh, bar universities and pension funds from divesting from Israel. Uh, so you can imagine different laws uh, playing out like that. Um, Ruben, we're, we're out of time somehow, which is astonishing to me. Um, let, let me ask you uh, right now, what's the best way to keep up with you? Is it on LinkedIn or somewhere else? LinkedIn. Yeah, LinkedIn is right now the best way to do this. I've had to shift the way, you know, what used to be Twitter is now not what it used to be. It may become the best way to keep up. That's where I've been posting. I'm hoping to post a couple of new things this coming week. And uh, that's probably the best way to find out, you know, what type of mischief I'm getting up to. Well, thank you for helping us get up to mischief this past hour. Um, these are great, great scenarios. And this has been, for everyone, a terrific discussion. Um, thank you, Ruben, so much. Uh, please enjoy the black monolith behind you. Um, I hope it leads you to a space station. Thank you. Uh, and uh, for everybody thank else, uh, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a terrific discussion. Uh, I hope to get the recording up and uh, to share the slides as well as uh, uh, digest of your notes. Um, if you want to keep talking about this, we have uh, the potential to do so on any of the social media outlets, uh, from Twitter to LinkedIn, Mastodon, and Threads, and Blue Sky, and of course, my blog. Uh, if you'd like to look into previous sessions that we've done, previous scenarios, as well as sessions that cover some of the topics that came up today, you can find our archive at tinyurl.com slash fdfarchive. If you'd like to look at our sessions coming up and everything from enrollment to grading to Trump to the future workforce, just go to the forum website at forum.futureofeducation.us. Thank you again for uh, talking and thinking with us. It's been a pleasure uh, visiting the Black or having the Black Swan visit all of us. I hope everybody here is uh, safe and sound. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere, I hope you're as cool as you can be. Uh, take care. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>